I forgot that. The other bit uh, when you look at is that when it when you look at in terms of how much of this money is split between three or four important sectors. So travel, if you look at because tourism consists of travel and hospitality, right? So in a way, when you look at this particular uh, concept, if you look at the transport cost or the traveling cost amounts to about 575 billion. So if you look at somebody um, traveling on holidays to a particular destination, you look at revenues coming in through airline, you look at revenues coming in through the travel sector in particular, like agents, you know, bookings from hotel and things like that. And that also amounts to a lot of direct in coming into that economy right now if you go to the market you can buy products like when you go to a supermarket you can buy products through three four routes isn't it you pay for your products by credit card you can pay by debit card you can also pay by cash correct mm -hmm. now if you are going to say for example a particular country to visit now because you are coming in as a traveler there are lots of ways the country makes money one is it could be that you're traveling and you have to apply for visa. So the, you know, one of the sectors, which is the, uh, you know, the foreign ministry looks at making money because you've applied for a visa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The other way that we look at is because you're traveling to that destination for business or for leisure or whatever it is, even if you're going and attending a conference for business purposes and you're going to stay there for two days, you're traveling by an airline or traveling by, you know, some sort of a means of transport that also brings revenue directly to the particular sector which is airline sector now when you stay in a hotel uh, whether it's booked by you paid by you or paid by for your company that hotel which is nothing but a part of the service sector in terms of accommodations also makes money because you're spending uh, uh, you're, you're basically taking their services for a number of days and against which you're going to make payments and this would not happen if a local person city living in that city will not go and stay in a hotel because he will like to stay in his own house and will not want to give money away for two nights say, or three nights stay. Isn't it? So yep, that yep. traveler coming into that particular city looks at injection in terms of, you know, uh, of fresh capital or fresh money because he's going to be using those services for the hotel. So you have visa, you have flights, you have hotel. And then when you look at other places, like, you know, you take a taxi, you take a tram, or, you know, you use railways or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're also spending money. So in general, when you look at the economy gets a boost or that particular city in terms of its uh, services that the traveler uses, <clears throat> they get a bit of a, uh, you know, boost in terms of income coming in, not from just the city itself, the people within the city, but from visitors who are coming to visit the city uh, for mm -hmm. a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So overall, tourism, if you look at, is a very important contributor to the economic activity of that particular location. And if you have tourism growing, um, you know, at a rapid pace, that means that particular city or that location could have a major in impact on, in terms of its economic growth. And that would bring in more revenue and more money. And in general, the city becomes or the location becomes prosperous. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, so this point which I made is the tourism is the world's number one export earner ahead of other products. You know, so this is like an export that you're doing. If you're able to successfully, you know, position your uh, town, city, country as a tourist destination country, then this is a particular uh, place wherein you are able to actually earn instantly by providing those services because the people are coming from abroad. Correct? Mm -hmm. You get that point? Mm -hmm. yeah, now, yeah. The other, other areas that we look at is because of people coming to your city and, you know, using some of these services, it also creates jobs directly, right? Now, yes, if yes. we know London was to host the Olympics, there was obviously a augmentation of the infrastructure which was happening in London, like the building of the new stadium, you know, augmentation of rooms in the hotel, in general, the city preparing that, okay, we are going to get an influx of so many million visitors coming to watch the Olympic Games and because of which, you know, a lot of bed and breakfast and the food sector in particular, you know, the tourist destinations were gearing up to basically look at, uh, you know, receiving this influx of visitors because they knew that because of these, uh, because of the Olympic uh, Olympics happening in London, this event would actually bring in a lot of uh, temporary job creation in the city. And in general, that was good considered for the city itself because 
uh, you know, it led to increased output, increased productivity, and more money in generally the population of the of the city because those who were involved in providing these services. So, in some cases, what also happens is the World Bank, also, you know, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World, uh, you know, uh, Health Organization, UNESCO, some of these major bodies also help in investments. Uh, in a particular destination because they do feel that if tourism as an activity grows in that area or in that region, what will tend to happen is that it will alleviate some of the things like poverty. That means it will bring people out of poverty because they, if they get employment, if they get money coming in, they will be able to, you know, self-sustaining, uh, they, they will have the means to be able to sustain themselves. That means they'll have a livelihood and an earning and that tends to, you know, kind of move um, uh, you know, uh, money or projects which are then funded by these organizations to create, uh, you know, the ability of uh, uh, transforming a particular location into a, a tourist location. So these are important factors. Now, when you look at Burma, for example, going back to just to Burma, as an example is, Burma has a very old heritage in terms of the, uh, you know, the religion, Buddhism, for example. Mm-hmm. But because people who are Buddhist and those who are living in the outside world have never been able to visit Burma because of the closed regime and, you know, the, the military and the dictatorship rule, mm-hmm. now they have the opportunity to go and visit. So what the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are doing is they are helping fund major renovation projects which are related to the archaeological sites or historical sites in Burma, the mm-hmm. temples which are there which obviously have not been maintained very well under the military rule uh, for a number of years and uh, decades. So they are kind of funding some of these activities because if they know that if this particular destination or that particular temple uh, or that location becomes a tourist destination, what will happen is whatever money is being invested right now in renovation will actually come out from the fees which the visitors pay to visit that particular location. And in general, mm-hmm. that would help create, you know, job opportunities in that local area wherein that renovation is happening. For example, the renovation of a large temple is happening. Then mm-hmm. construction site would require workers, you know, local people who will kind of work within that uh, renovation project. And that would create jobs that will put money into the people's pocket. That will mm-hmm. also help recreate that particular, uh, you know, preserve that temple and, you know, bring it back to its original glory. And once it is restored, that will drive tourism to that location, which would mean that money, other avenues of money will start coming into that local town, economy, country, wherein that would then pay for itself. So even organizations like World Bank, International Monetary Fund, end up, you know, putting money into these restoration projects the world from time to time, which creates opportunities to basically look at promoting travel. Now, just as a concept, you know, when you look at two, uh, 700 million people uh, in around, uh, you know, the time frame of 2000 to 2002, when the dot-com bubble actually burst, you had things like the 9-11 during that time happening. What you have seen is that tourism in general, you know, people, I, I don't know in terms of whether whether you have ever looked at it this way, is that if you look at, um, you know, anything beyond, uh, you know, before 1990. Mm-hmm. Because in most countries, liberalization, globalization, and, you know, LPG, privatization did not happen as a concept. There was no concept of tourism. Only the very few rich could afford to travel to locations, uh, you know, for uh, for holidays and for leisure activities. Most of the travel at that point in time, because of the non-development of infrastructure, uh, you know, airlines industry, was predominantly business and political travel. But after the 1990s, when most of the countries underwent the process of liberalization, privatization, and globalization in the third world, that means in the developing countries, mm-hmm. that is where then the tourism as a sector began to gain importance. The significance of tourism as a sector, as a, as a serious player or as a serious ministry within the government departments actually began to happen. Because it led to the development of, you know, rail ports or, you know, seaports, uh, airports in certain locations. And beyond that, if I look at myself, you know, coming across from India, so if I remember anything beyond, uh, you know, 1990, you had only the four or five major airports in India, like Delhi, Mumbai, you know, and mm-hmm. Chennai, Kolkata. Yeah. But yeah. now, 
I look at after 1990, uh, you know, when liberalization, privatization happened, and up until 2000, we had about, you know, 160 airports, out of which, you know, about 17 or 18 were international airports. That means you could go into a city like uh, Chandigarh, you know, you mm-hmm. could go into a city like uh, Ahmedabad, you could go into a city like, for example, in the east, if I remember, you know, Kolkata was the only international airport. There was no other airport in Assam or, you know, in other places which are the eastern states. There were only charter flights. That means tourists had to come to Kolkata. And from Kolkata, they had to travel or take a meal and go to other destinations if they were visiting. Mm -hmm. There were no direct connections available. But after the privatization started to happen in 1990 and by 2000, there were international airports in Assam, Jalpaiguri, you know, international airports in Mizoram, Arunachal Pradesh. And, you know, you could come into these destinations directly from other locations. Mm-hmm. Similarly, if you look at, say, for example, if, if I look at, say, Bangladesh, for example, you know, Dhaka might be the only international airport that uh, Bangladesh has as of now. But at some stage, because of the development happening and the development of seaport happening, you know, what will happen is that there will be other places, other destinations, which will also have the development of international or connecting links to airports. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you look at Sri Lanka, Colombo was the only location wherein there was an international airport. But now you have an international airport in Jaffna as well. And you have international airport in, uh, you know, the outskirts into, uh, you know, some of the islands which Sri Lanka has, wherein you could now travel to Colombo and from there a connecting flight is possible. But, if we look at uh, uh, locations like, you know, um, inner locations, obviously you have to travel by rail or by road to be able to, you know, access that destination. So the growth is happening in these third world countries because some of these projects which are being financed are financed to develop the infrastructure. And the development of infrastructure is also leading to the creation of these new destinations wherein the uh, uh, tourism is Okay? Yeah. Now, if if we look at you know, where do where did the people travel if, in terms of if we just look at a snapshot of you know uh, people traveling from from a point of view of Europe Europe alone you know in Europe on an average in 2004 uh, when we look at about 58 million people used to travel by air you know or travel for holidays where did they go in terms of holiday or where did they go in terms of uh, for leisure activities. So if you look at 27 million people used to go to Asian countries or Asia Pacific, 16 million went to Europe, 9 million went to Americas, about 4 million to Middle East, and only about 2 million going to Africa. Mm-hmm. Now this particular slide is, is slightly old, but the context of this particular slide is that when you look at uh, international development of tourism, the other factors that we discussed, things like socio-political factors, factors which are related to you know, demographics, factors that are related to economic ac- output. There is one particular factor which you look at is that um, in the case of travel, when it starts to happen or tourism, when it starts to develop, what you do get to see is that the regional economy also has to be conducive. Now, why the there was a dip in particular, uh, say, when you look at 2004, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, travel, was that when you look at the Iraq war, when it happened, you know, mm-hmm. there, when you look at that particular time frame, when the Iraq war happened between the 2004 to 2000, you know, uh, six time frame, Middle East as a reason lost out on tourism because of the fact that it was considered unstable, unsafe as a destination to travel. Right. Mm-hmm. So there are international yeah. factors which also affect tourism growth in some of these locations or in geographies sometimes because of political events happening in that uh, location. And this led to a dip in travel because there were restrictions on travel, uh, you know, air travel in particular, uh, you know, obviously because of the Iraq war happening and because of which there was, you know, there was there was a negative growth in terms of people coming to Middle East as a reason because of security reasons, terrorist reasons and the war activity. But after this particular thing has happened. What we do see is that the tourism is slowly and gradually growing in these countries is because when we look at Iran and Iraq in particular, you know, which is Shia, and there are lots of, uh, you know, religious shrines there in that particular location, people have started to travel again, and the confidence 
come back again. Now the region is much more stable as compared to when it was during the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, when you look at third world countries in particular, there are factors which affect the growth and development of tourism. And these factors, uh, mostly, if they are affecting the growth and uh, you know uh, the uh, the proliferation of tourism industry in general in that particular location, is because of the fact that the political environment is not very conducive. That means there is no political will or um, you know political um, uh, push from the government to kind of uh, create tourism as a major sector or as a major services provider in the country. And because of which the tourism in that location also sometimes suffers. Now, any questions on this so far? No, that's no, fine. That's fine. Okay. So now, going forward, let's look at briefly the concept of sustainable tourism. Now, mm -hmm. sustainable to sustainable, uh, you know, word as I said is basically you are looking at sustaining or living within your means or living within the resources that you have because resources, natural resources are finite. Mm -hmm. So the concept of sustainable tourism is coming in wherein what now major organizations which fund, you know, projects to develop tourism in countries are kind of propagating the fact is that there is there, there is a, there is limited natural resources available in any location and these resources need to be preserved or they need to be managed and effectively used in order to, uh, you know, kind of build tourism as an activity in that area. And this particular concept of sustainable tourism then has three interconnected aspects. That means when you look at the concept of sustainable tourism, environment comes into play, social, cul cultural, or, so, you know, the cultural environment comes into play, and it also has a play from the economic output happening from that particular location. Yeah, yeah. And here the idea is to always use these resources from a point of view that they are finite. That means they are not available uh, indefinitely. They are available in finite, uh, you know, proportions. And because when you try and look at this activity of developing growth and promoting a particular location as a destination for tourism or for tourist uh, purposes, you look at considering environment. Uh, and environment factors, things like, you know, preservation of water, cleanliness, you know, uh, recycling of waste. You look at social cultural reasons, that means if it's a if it's a place which basically has a particular culture or certain, uh, you know, uh, heritage, that needs to be preserved when this destination is to be, you know, approached as a uh, destination for tourism or travel. And last but not the least, the kind of investment going into that location should promote economic activity that means it should lead to positive growth in the economy of that particular location by utilizing the natural resources and that concept is nothing but the concept of sustainable tourism so if you look at the great barrier reef in australia right a lot of visitors go to the great barrier reef because they want to see corals and you know related to the sea life they want to see that as an environment but because of the over um, you know promotion of the uh, let's put it this way over promotion by the australian tourism board to uh, promote the great barrier reef as a tourist destination what has happened is that a lot of people are visiting it they are diving and obviously going and looking at the barriers touching the corals it is leading to the depletion or degradation of the barrier reef and this is not just done by tourism activity alone but there are other natural contributing factors. For example, the cyclones which hit the Great Barrier Reef, or the pollution which is increasing in the in in terms of the sea, uh, you know, around that area. Um, they are also looking at the uh, detrimental effects of international fishing happening in the Barrier Reef. So all these factors are contributing to the dele depletion of the barrier. That means the barrier, the Great Barrier Reef, the corals, you know, the the, the that reef which is spread across 1,600 miles is slowly and gradually shrinking and it is shrinking at a rate wherein they say by 20, 2050 and 2060, 50% of the Great Barrier Reef would have been gone. Okay. Now, are you there? Yeah. Please yeah. Please yeah. Please so, so basically what now the Australian Travel Board is looking at doing is they are trying to promote sustainable growth within that region, which does not deplete the Great Barrier Reef as a as a as a tourist uh, you know as a attraction and what they are looking at is they are putting uh, measures into place 
wherein they are restricting fishing, for example, they are restricting the Great Barrier Reef uh, in, from a point of view of travel in terms of the sea routes. They are looking at making sure that any water or any, uh, you know, uh, 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 say for example, any water, any sewage, anything which is being pumped from uh, the cities and going into the, uh, you know, rivers and from rivers going to that particular ocean is treated before it is discharged. So these impacts, you know, these particular uh, things which have been put in place have been put in place in order to preserve uh, the natural environment of the Great Barrier Reef, but also not restrict, uh, you know, the tourists coming into, you know, obviously see the Great Barrier Reef for as a location, uh, you know, for them to visit. But the whole idea of now promoting this is being done from the context of, you know, something looking at how to look at sustaining this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now there is lots of money which is also being spent uh, in in conservation of these, uh, you know, in terms of projects for conservation, and this <clears throat> in turn is actually benefiting the local communities because it is creating jobs and it is creating, um, you know, livelihood in terms of new activities which these communities have been given charge to look at and maintain. And obviously, uh, all this requires, you know, certain management structures to be put in place. That means the Australian Tourism Board has restructured in the last few years to look at sustainable uh, or sustainability in the tourism at the Great Barrier Reef as a new department coming into play, which looks at measures and monitoring and evaluation of some of the activities which happen in that area in particular. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, the concept of what we call the sustainable tourism. And this is something that we have to look more detail you know, going forward. So now, again, going back to some of the factors that we studied. Now, how is sustainable tourism environment and what is its contribution to some? So we have to look at that. Now, environment basically is obviously in some places when you look at environment is natural and in some cases man-made. Can you think of places wherein, you know, over the last few years we have created man-made islands or you know man-made uh, cities uh, in, 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 in man-made island plus uh, the city is completely that, that is correct so when you look at the creation of these estuaries which have happened you know uh, like in the creation of Jumeirah beach or the farms which have been created you know, in Dubai, for example, Netherlands, when you look at it as a destination, they are always reclaiming land from the sea. So what is happening is when they try and reclaim land from the sea, they are trying to basically, you know, um, these creation of islands looked at dredging as an activity. Mm -hmm. now, dredging as an activity was that basically from the sea floor, the sand is uh, brought in, which is uh, the natural, uh, you know, sand. And that is used to create an island in terms of, you know, um, uh, because it has a natural element of, um, you know, setting quite quickly and it does not have the feature of erosion because it's natural, naturally created. So dredging as an activity basically destroyed a lot of sea life or, you know, disturbed the balance within the, uh, you know, area around the places wherein the islands were created. So what has happened is, over the years, the environmental effect has been that the fishing has totally vanished from locations like, uh, you know, uh, fishes have totally disappeared as an industry that has seen a decline because, uh, because of the alteration of this natural balance. So when it led to the creation of palms, and if you see the, uh, you know, how palms are created, um, so palms in Dubai, uh, and when you look at the image to see around you know that water around comes which is this you know that uh -huh. area fish so it's an unmade island what has happened is the sea comes in but the flow of water they had to create these canals so that the recycling of water within this particular ways can happen when you look at you know uh, this particular natural environment and this has led to the depletion of fish. So basically, there is no related activity, even though if you see this particular island, there is no related activity within this area. So this is an environmental impact of tourism, uh, which is uh, which has happened because of man-made reasons. And what they're trying to do is now 
obviously look at growing colonies of fish and you know animals which can actually come in and you know start inhabiting this particular area yeah. but it is totally devoid of sea life in this particular area as you can see this is sea you normally would expect that there would be fishes and other sea life here but there is very little uh, you know elements of sea life in this location because of the creation of you know the man made island so yeah. sometimes the development of these kind of uh, you know um, uh, things actually leads to uh, adverse environmental effects and that in general is created a lot of activity of tourism so people when they go to dubai they want to visit this particular man made island the palms and there is a tourist uh, you know destination you can go and stay in the hotel you know you can do a bit of activities you know take a leisure boat and go around but what is happening is because of the uh, because of the impact of uh, no sea life within this it is also creating you know a detrimental effect in the area as far as fishing is concerned so, so this is environmental effect wherein you have looked at the effect of construction in particular and the over development of you know um, uh, say dredging which has led to this depletion of you know sea life in and around that area so this is negative effect uh even though it is uh, um, you know tourism developing in uh, you know third world countries or the third uh, world locations but uh, the tourism has a positive effect but it has a negative effect as far as the environment is concerned so when this was being constructed lot of pollution was there lot of uh, sea life marine life was affected uh, you know because of dredging lot of fish uh, in this area got depleted some of the species have got wiped out because of extensive dredging and you know at that point in time uh, it was uh, being heavily criticized when this was being uh, constructed by the international community because it was leading to uh, this you know kind of an imbalance mm -hmm. within the natural resources in that area so this effect on when you look at the environment now when look at when we look at socio cultural what we are looking at is the effect which it has uh, culturally on communities living in that area now some of them tend to adapt if they you know look at basically um, going along with the development of tourism in that area they will adapt they will prosper and obviously take up new jobs or new types of jobs and uh, you know adapt to the lifestyle but in some cases what tends to happen is these communities do not adapt and because of which they tend to you know suffer now uh, uh, an example of this would be look at the brazil uh, you know forests now here what is happening is the large scale deforestation of you know amazon forest is leading to the cultural change wherein what is that the tribes which were actually in that area you know the local tribes in that area which are communities living aboriginals or kind of people which are living within which have lived there for generations are having to move so what is happening is they have no significant role to play in the development of tourism but what has been encroached on or the modern culture is actually coming in and changing their indigenous uh, you know behavior in terms of communities living within the amazon forest so this is nothing but a cultural change or a social cultural change because it is impacting the people who have lived in the amazon forest and have treated amazon as their livelihood for a number of years when you look at you know the people uh, the old tribes which are a part of uh, part and parcel of the american uh, you know the not the american say the brazilian amazon forest okay. and similar is the case when you look at the american indians you know when the colonization of america started um, and there were you know these great wars and conflicts which tended to happen between the american indians and you know when uh, spanish the french and the english were trying to colonize uh, us yeah. what you see is that it led to the um, you know kind of extinction of american indians in certain areas of uh, america and that is nothing but the socio cultural change which is typically happening that means you know for a variety of reasons you will see host communities often become weaker in terms of their interaction uh, because they are not able to kind of you know uh, take up the modernization happening because of language barrier or because of barriers related to you know their cultural differences in some people tend to feel that the tourism changes because they also threaten the indigenous identity so if you look at indigenous 
uh, you know, people living within the forest. What you will get to understand is those people may have, you know, in uh, these people or tribes, as we call, you know, Africa, which were living in the deserts and had a very sustainability. What they, what we have seen is that they are kind of, you know, dwindling away. They, they, their generation is actually, you know, uh, you're totally uh, being eradicated because of organization was cut off from the modern world. Their mm -hmm. social uh, you know, their culture is very, very different from the modern culture. And because it is in the climate which is being promoted, they are not able to act. What you see is that their identity existence is being threatened, right? So this is an effect of, you know, socio-cultural uh, kind of an impact when Brazil as a country is growing, is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And because of the resources available in the Amazon forest, it is leading to deforestation, which means the area wherein these indigenous people live and how they survive are basically becoming less and less. And because of which they are uh, going to, you know, have the adverse effects in terms of uh, you know, tourism or development of tourism in that location. Mm -hmm. Now, economic activity, I think it's pretty obvious. I don't need to explain this. Economic activity in general is looked at from a point of view of increased job growth. It looks at bringing in new into the economy. It creates opportunities both for the young as well as, you know, the youth population who want to engage in, uh, you know, the, uh, the aspect of uh, getting employed within this industry. And then the economic benefit is that the particular location city has much more, you know, money available or uh, ca capital freedom available, which leads to the creation of private sector jobs, public sector jobs, and, you know, in general, this city or the location actually prospers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, let's look at some of the uh, leakage effects of tourism. Now, what is leakage? What is the word? What does the word leakage mean to you? What do you understand by leakage? Mm, leakage effect, like I mean, I think it's kind of little neg negative effect for tourism. Uh, so leakage, in particular, when we define, you know, leak leak as a word or leakage as a word is a word which talks about that. Okay, if you have, say, for example, water flowing and suddenly there's a hole in the pipe, what it does uh, to that particular flow of water is that the water seeps tries to seep out from that particular hole. And it then creates a detrimental effect in terms of the supply or the flow of water happening in the pipe. So leakage is an effect, you know, leakage is a concept basically means that in some cases, uh, the tourism activity will have some sort of a negative effect uh, yeah. because it does not, uh, sometimes what tends to happen is you do something and you spend a bit of money, but it does not give you the, uh, you know, the outcome in terms of what it was desiring to do. Exactly. So you say, for example, spend a bit of money on yourself for buying clothes. But at the end of it, you do not find that these flows are apt for that you bought to go across to maybe an evening dinner meal, uh, you know, which is an official dinner. So what has happened is you have effectively spent that money. But what has happened is that money uh, may, may not have, you know, brought you the intended benefit that you had basically looked at spending that for. So similarly, leakage effect in tourism basically talks about, you know, um, uh, a concept which is in which, you know, the revenue generated by tourism is actually lost to other countries or economies. So if a particular area starts to promote tourism, but what tends to happen is that in some cases, some of that promotion also starts to benefit other locations in that area. In the case of countries, for example, then that means that you, though as a country, you spend a lot of money into promoting, you know, tourist activity, but that has in general led to the growth of tourism in that region altogether, rather than just your country. Mm -hmm. And this is nothing but an effect called the leakage effect, wherein leakage may be significant, uh, you know, in the case of developing countries, because it kind of neutralizes the money generated by tourism. Because there's lots of development happening in other sectors as well. What tends to happen is that the, the concept of promotion of money being spent into, say, uh, as a country like India is spending a lot of money into Tourism India. You know, there's a campaign which they are running, which is Tourism India or you know, special India, something like that. But because India is growing so fast as a country, and there is lots of development happening at all fronts, at all levels, whether it's economic, you know, uh, social, political, cultural, demographic, there is lots of development happening. Sometimes that money, 
which is being spent by the government in terms of promoting India as a tourist destination, if they have to recalculate the effects or ROI of this money being spent, it is dif it becomes difficult is because of the you know kind of overreaching economic growth happening across all the sectors. Mm -hmm. Normally, what you will see is that in some places you you put money in and you find an immediate uh, you know effect in terms of returns coming in, but because there is development and growth happening in all the sectors of the economy. It is very difficult to pinpoint a particular dollar being spent on tourism and then looking at studying the return on investment for that because that translates into development happening in the country uh, overall. Okay. So here the concept that we have looked at is basically, you know, leakage occurs because of various, uh, you know, reasons. And in some cases, it could be because of the development of international tourism. And in some cases, it could be other things like, uh, in general, what we see is we are promoting, say, India as a country for tourism destination. But because India's exports are growing and the goods and services are growing as well, so that effect of money being spent on tourism is being negated out by the growth happening in other sectors like export, you know, infrastructure, for example. It could be that uh, the government is trying to spend a lot of money um from an aspect of you know looking at growing uh the number of visitors coming to a destination but what they end end up finding is that if the money being spent into promotions the considerable amount of some say going into advertisement publicity is actually not having any impact on uh you know increasing the tourist numbers in that location because india as a destination is not considered safe uh, for women to travel for example so the tourist growth, which is supposed to happen in terms of numbers, is actually not happening because of the fact that the the cultural climate or the uh, the the you know the um, let's put it this way, the safety factor is not a very very uh, you know dominant um, um, you know is a very dominant the safety aspect is a very dominant uh, criteria and decision making for people traveling to India. So if they find that the safety is becoming an issue. Even though they want to visit the uh, country, they are not able to visit or they kind of put off their travel because they find the safety as a bigger issue than uh, taking the risk to travel to India. Yeah. So that concept is nothing but the concept of, you know, leakage. That means you're spending the money in good faith, but because there are other factors which also affect this particular, uh, you know, growth of tourism or the reason why people come to visit a particular city has effects uh, or has factors affecting them which is in terms of safety which is in terms of travel for example the infrastructure might not be available you might want to go and visit agra but because agra does not have an international airport and the connectivity is through delhi you might be you know dissuaded by the fact that okay for me i need to take a eight hour flight go to delhi then from there take a train you know i think it's not worth it let's drop it and second the most important thing is that the safety is a big issue as far as the city is concerned you know, so let's drop this destination. Mm -hmm. So these are ways wherein there's a lot of money which the Indian government is spending to promote Agra or Taj Mahal as a destination for a visit, but that money is being offset by other reasons or uh, other fears in the minds of travelers. And that effect is nothing but the leakage effect. That means the money being spent is not actually yielding the results because of other factors affecting the, uh, you know, the choice of decision or the decision making criteria for that particular location. Mm -hmm. So here what we look at is two effects of leakage. One is import and the other is export. Now import is occurs when tourists demand standards of equipment, food and other you know products that the host country cannot supply. So sometimes what you do is you try and you want to visit to, for example, you want to go to a safari in Kenya and things like that, but because there's no electricity or 24 hours water in the hotel, what tends to happen is those demands do not meet your demands. And what you do is you put off the travel to that destination. Okay. Yep. So that is an import leakage. An export leakage is uh, multinational corporations, large foreign businesses have a substantial share in import. So in poor developing destinations, MSC is only source investment capital to construct tourism interest. So here what is happening is we are looking at, a, uh, you know, a particular wastage happening when you have uh, what you call foreign investors having a greater stake in terms of you know uh, influencing and as well as a greater stake in uh, kind of influencing the preferences available to visitors in that location so here the export leakage is 
if in a country you see a lot of infrastructure like hotels airports being owned by foreign companies what tends to happen is the government is putting a lot of money into uh, uh, to to promote this as a tourism uh, you know as a destination but at the end of it the increased visitors and the increased revenue coming to that location is actually being siphoned off as profits by privatization which has happened in that location okay mm-hmm. that understood as a point yeah this is understood so if i look at say for example every government has a challenge to maintain balance between private and public partnership right or ownership in the location mm-hmm. now if they privatize a uh, uh, tourism uh, say for example mauritius as a country um if they privatize the international airport which is the only international airport in the country from which tourists come and go and they privatize that airport what will happen is a lot of revenue which comes in through the travel route uh, or because of money being spent at the airport when people visit uh, mauritius as a country mm-hmm. if it's in the private ownership what tends to happen is that the profits being generated from that should which actually should benefit the local economy and create employment you know put more money in the pe- people's pocket in terms of uh, you know opportunities for growth will actually be siphoned off as profits by the private investor or the company and they will be repatriated to their country of origin so what effectively that is doing is that is having something called a leakage effect which is in the form of exports even though the money generated is generated in mauritius international airport but because it is under private ownership that money government has no control on it and the private investor is able to take that back as profits to his home country so that money is essentially not available for growth or you know promoting economic growth in that area even though the money is coming from that area and that is nothing but an example of export leakage mm-hmm. now let's eco tourism have you come across this eco tourism eco tourism in particular so eco tourism is nothing but when you are trying to visit you know a particular destination because uh you want to go and see maybe the n- nature in in a, in a certain aspect mm-hmm. but eco tourism as a as a as a tourist destination now is being consciously kind of you know uh, looked at with a bit of scrutiny is because the the environment or the place that you want to visit actually has you know a lot of um, uh let's put it this way has you know very fragile or pristine or undisturbed you know natural areas so there are certain islands for example in uh, thailand when you look at or there are certain islands wherein obviously they are not allowed for tourism is because the islands what the government or the local communities do not want is they do not want to alter the balance uh, of these uh, you know natural environments in terms of uh visits from uh, you know tourist uh, attractions so let's look at uh, to give you an example now eco tourism the best way to for me to define would be that you know when you look at something like you visit a particular area um, let's look at uh, example you visit a museum right now when you visit a museum you are handed a leaflet when you are at the entrance that please do not touch any artifacts or respects the sign wherein it says this not is this is not to be touched and stay behind this line or stay behind that particular barrier right the reason why they ask you to do it is because they want to preserve the natural identity of uh, you know the particular uh, location but at the same time they want you know you to be able to visit and see that artifact or see the particular things which are a part of your culture or important uh, to your culture but they want to restrict access to it so that they are able to preserve it for as long as possible mm-hmm. so similarly when you look at the concept of eco tourism there are certain places wherein the natural environment needs to be preserved because those are the only locations like when you look at galapagos island you know galapagos island are islands which were created by volcanic activity and if you look at galapagos island i don't know whether you heard about that uh, no okay galapagos island you know they were islands which were actually created in the pacific ocean because of uh, you know volcanic overflow 
Now, these islands are very close to country, uh, Ecuador in South America. But, um, you know, what they have done is they've restricted the access uh, uh, from a your tourist destination to these islands. Okay. Charles Darwin actually, you know, uh, which proposed the Darwinism theory of survival of the fittest and things like that, actually visited these islands in the year 1835. And here he observed that there is a wide ranging, uh, you know, uh, wildlife thriving in an area wherein some of the species found in this particular island or a belt of islands is not available any place else in the world. And because this particular area has certain amount of cultural diversity in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say the natural environment, the government has taken steps to kind of preserve this particular area. And this is now a natural or a world heritage site, wherein the, there is a restriction on the amount of tourism which can happen in this location. And this is to preserve the natural beauty of that environment or the natural beauty of these islands. Okay, so okay. this particular concept wherein you look at in uh, wherein the natural environment becomes increasingly important because of the preservation is the concept of nothing but ecotourism. So ecotourism then looks at a sustainable uh, aspect of tourism uh, because what they want to do is if they restrict the number of tourists visiting that location, that would mean that there is less amount of pollution or, you know, any detrimental effect on that environment because of tourist tourist activity and the main idea of here uh, ecotourism is that, for example great barrier reef if i give you the same example now it is falling under not just sustainable tourism but they are also promoting it as an ecotourism destination because if you want to visit the natural environment of how coral reefs grow and you know how this great barrier reef has come about and how it kind of maintains a very fine balance for you know about 2000 different species in the ocean they are promoting it from a concept of conservation to preserve this natural environment, but also from a point of view of creating it, it as a site wherein it has a natural heritage. So that means it is important for the uh, area to be preserved for uh, future civilizations to you know have access to this, and that is where the concept of ecotourism actually comes in. So in the case of tourism, what they tend to do is they reduce the number of sizes in terms of the number of people having access to that destination. Okay. Now, one of the aspects, if you look at, you know, there are species population which are decreasing when you look at, so for example, tigers, for example, you look at, you know, orangutans, for example, you look at koala, for example, there are lots of species which are actually disappearing, right? Now, because they've been hunted uh, extensively over the years, what has happened is it has led to their kind of extinction. That means they are on the borderline of being extinct, that they will disappear from this world. So this concept of ecotourism is closely linked to the fact that access to, you know, these locations or these natural habitats is restricted because they are the only safe places or havens available for these populations in terms of say animal species to flourish. And that is where the restriction happens in terms of tourists or the type of numbers traveling to that destination. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. These, uh, these are examples of you know ecotourism. The last two slides that I put in basically is an example of you know how the orangutan population has like, decreased. Koala, for example, as a population is decreasing, okay, they they only say that there are only now uh, you know, fifteen thousand tigers left in the world. You know. <clears throat> so there is a lot of conservation happening and that conservation is happening in the creation of natural parks or, you know, uh, national pa uh, parks, wherein the restriction, there is restriction in terms of travel. So, for example, if you look at, um, I can give you an example of, say, when you look at parks within the UK, there are lots of natural parks within the UK, isn't it? Yes. Now, these have been created because, uh, you know, what the government says, they want to preserve the local flora and fauna, you know, in these national parks. So when you look at the, for example, the more locations you look at, uh, you know, if you go toward, for example, Scotland, Lake Windermere, all these lake districts, these are all being converted into something called the park. And here, the local 
diversity in terms of the flora and fauna, which means the animal life, the cultural, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the, which needs to be preserved for future generations. So here, the concept of tourism has been, uh, been applied because what they want to be able to do is they want to restrict uh, number of travelers going in. And if you, if you're traveling, what they do is certain activities that you do, you are not allowed to do certain things in those locations. Okay. Like, for example, if you go to Lake Windermere or, you know, some of the Lake District, if you are found littering, you know, there's a 500 pound fine uh, on, on, on that individual. And if you're not able to pay the fine, then it leads to about three to six months imprisonment. Now, this is being done because they want to preserve the water balance and, you know, the natural beauty of that particular environment. And that is nothing but the concept of something called ecotourism. So you are free to visit, you are able to go, but you have to kind of observe, uh, you know, rules and regulations to be able to preserve the environment and the natural beauty of that location. Yes. Okay. If you look at third world countries in particular, just to in the third world countries is the tourism, uh, you know, as an industry is growing very rapidly because it leads to overall economic growth. But because this economic growth is happening at a rapid pace, uh, what uh, the what is happening is that there are some concepts which are being introduced by organizations which fund, you know, these projects. And what they are saying is you need to look at development of tourism which sustains the existing environment in that location, and also in uh, you know in uh, in the case of natural habitats, things like the Great Barrier Reef. When you look at certain islands in particular, or when you look at certain uh, you know cities which are uh, cultural heritage cities they are promoting the concept of something called ecotourism which leads to sustainable development of uh, you know tourism that means it leads to growth in that area but it also preserves the cultural and the heritage of that particular location and those concepts are being promoted from an aspect of development of international tourism in you know third world or developing countries is that okay yeah that is where I'm copy, and I'm going to send you a copy of this presentation, a little detailed presentation on tourism and sustainable development. We will start with this particular slide, a uh, discussion on this presentation in the next section. And then I'm also going to send you a handout, which is, you know, a five or six page handout, uh, which you can directly relate, uh, you know, to the assignment uh, tasks uh, 4.2. Uh, tasks 2.1 and also the uh, you know task 3.1 which how uh, you know you're looking at basically um, uh, development happening in the international context which promotes tourist activity which leads to uh, you know the um, uh, the concept of development of sustainable tourism ecosystem and how they help how the third world countries are now being helped by some of the international organizations to promote this concept at the same time and not stop economic growth happening because of this particular sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I'll try and send yeah. this to you straight away after the session. And the yeah. other thing uh, uh, yeah. about assignment, did, may I get the feedback when you have time? Yes, part you part. Will get, yes, yes, you will get that, um, you know, from me. Basically, it's being marked by Anjum, so you will get that today. Definitely, I think by about uh, afternoon time. Okay, no problem. I think. Spoke to me yesterday is already marked. I'm start. I'm slowly, slowly doing the second assignment now. Writing, it's a writing already. That's fine. I think I spoke to him yesterday, so he's going to send that across uh, today, definitely. But I'll chase it up, and I think if, if worse comes worse, you'll probably end up getting it. Uh, you know, just before the afternoon time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. No worries. So um, thanks uh, so much today for uh, attending the session, Sajid. The other bit which I want to check with you very briefly is uh, what is the next date that we can do uh, this?